All right, everybody, welcome to the first episode of the Fighters Guild. We are here with, with uh, Kurt Toth, the infamous Kurt Toth, Bravo extraordinaire. How are you doing today, Kurt? Doing well, Max. Always good to see you, especially when you're not holding an Ira deck. That's right. Well, I got it. I got it right here. So. <laughs> It never leaves my sight, but uh, yeah, cool, man. So let's just uh, get a little general introduction of yourself, you know? So go ahead and just say maybe how you got into the game or how you got into the online events, how you got, you know, into Bravo. Yeah, so absolutely. I actually started buying a couple boxes. I'm a huge collector, actually. Is into sports cards originally. And that market, you know, as all markets do, went up and down a bit. And I, you know, heard about Flesh and Blood uh, through one of the Rudy videos. And I thought, let me give it a shot. And diving in without knowing too much about anything, of course, I bought my first unlimited box of uh, WTR, pulled a foil E-Strike out of it, sold it for 100 bucks, And I was like, okay, right, there's 25% profit on this one card that I know nothing about. And I've got the stack of cardboard sitting next to me to do something with at some point. Uh, at, then a local buddy was doing the same thing and he eventually started playing. And he said, Kurt, I have no one to play test against. You want to give this a shot? And I said, let's do it. So I built, uh, as most people did probably in WTR, I built a, a Dory deck and just started smashing. And he got really upset with me. Um, so then I joined an online event. A uh, quick shout out to Hidden Fortress. Started jumping in uh, the events there, and people had similar reactions to Dory. They're like, Kurt, you're such a jerk. I'm sick of seeing Dory, and I had tremendous success, but I was really tired of hearing people clown Dory. So I said, enough is enough. I'm going to switch it just to not hear people uh, gripe about it. So off to Bravo I went, and I thought, nobody's playing this guy. Uh, except Kale in New Zealand, and no one's, no one's seen Kale over here in the Hidden Fortress or the other on online events, so let me give this a run. And, and the rest is history. I got hooked on the game. So. How I got to know you was playing in some online events, playing against each other multiple times in the winning seats, and uh, took a liking to you, and then, you know, we've been talking and stuff in some of these online events, and, you know, the way that you play Bravo... I think is a little above and beyond the rest of the field compared to what I've seen so far, you know? So, um, I think that's really awesome. I think, uh, you know, you're, you're leaps and bounds ahead in general from some of the average players that, that fight in a, any given armory online, you know? So appreciate you saying that. Yeah, for sure. So maybe you could, uh, just kind of go into where your head's at on any given game. With Bravo, you know, like what's your strategy? What are you ultimately trying to do? And I guess we can do Blitz first and then maybe dive into CC. Sure, yeah. So it's funny because everyone's stuck on on meta Bravo. And, uh, you know, you've played me long enough to know and those that, that have uh, interacted with me or played me know I'm not a meta guy. Not only am I not a meta guy, I don't actually believe the meta really exists uh, at this point. Um, I mean, that said, of course, you have your, your iras of the world, as you know all too well. So, so right. take, take that in context. But the key with Bravo as I play it is it's not a typical build, right? It, right. I, I try to, uh, I run, as you know, Toma Findel, uh, which, which you're not going to find in every Bravo deck. Uh, you yeah. see it a little more often now. And the build is certainly atypical. Um, I've just run into so many, as you know, the Iras, the Dorinthias, the, the Kanos of the world. And, and without sideboarding, getting a build to match up against all of those is very tricky. Um, so I, I tried to, I studied all of them. And I think the, the big difference between a lot of the players is I know those heroes as well as I know Bravo. So I know what they're trying to do. And, and I try to pressure them and, and give them decisions. I firmly believe in this game. Uh, it's, a, it's a great game. I'm sure we're going to talk about it at some point in terms of how it's, how it's designed and, and what makes it so great. But the reason why I love it is I'm forcing people to make decisions and they inherently are going to make mistakes. Um, I hear so many people, you know, a lot of people play with chain and they're like, I'm just not going to block, right? And I'm just going to apply pressure and I'm going to pound you. 
And, and IRA players generally have a similar belief unless they flick flack you to death, right? But, but, but they do enough damage with the cards they have and they always have an inherent strategy, right? If I block with two cards, then I can do this much damage with two. So the key for me with Bravo is force decisions and force actions that they don't want to make. You're never or rarely going to see me pummel a weapon unless it's against Kano because I want to, I want to force you to consider the idea of discarding a card that you don't want to discard. Um, so I'm going to make atypical plays. I'm not always just going to dominate a crippling crush. I'm not always just going to dominate a spinal crush and make, make those decisions straightforward, right? Do I block with one card from hand or not? It's going to be more complex than that. I'm going to, I'm going to bluff you. I'm going to set up big turns. I'm going to eat damage in certain instances when I know what you can and cannot push out. And I'm going to make you make a mistake. And if I can't make you make a mistake, because someone like your caliber, Max, who just throughout the course of any given game, you're not going to make a mistake. I'm still going to force you to make decisions that you otherwise don't want to have to make. Like, are you going to eat this pummel and discard a card? Then, then go for it, right? Or are you going to try to block that down? Are you going to uh, eat a pummel, disable, and lose your arsenal and a card from hand? You know, make, that, yeah. make those decisions, but I'm going to consistently force you into those, into those predicaments. Right. Yeah, I, yeah, I love that, that mode of thinking, right, that strategy, because, you know, Flesh and Blood is a newer game. So you're playing against people that don't have, you know, as much experience um, in card games in general. I think there's a lot of hype in this game. There's new people who are coming in. And when you compound their mistakes over the course of a game, whether it's long or short, you know, CC to Blitz, you're going to take the W, generally speaking, right? Um, so I think coming into the game, that's something that, I originally started playing Dorinthia as well because I thought people are going to make mistakes against me and I want to force that exactly how you said, I want to force you to make a mistake or entice you into making a mistake, right? With sure. hidden information, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, and you know, something interesting specifically about Bravo, right? Is no, I'm not going to dominate this crippling crush because if I dominate and then pummel, you're losing two cards. This guy might block with four cards. That's right. You know what I mean? So I, that's right. I really uh, think that's core. Cool. There's just so many triggers in Bravo. <laughs> it's just, yeah. so, it's difficult to play against, right? If, if, right? if you know how to apply pressure. And I find a lot of people are, especially in Blitz, they're scared to take damage. Absolutely. Right? Uh, because, because these heroes are so dangerous. Dorinthia can go off for 20 plus a turn. Ira can just go bananas with seemingly one card. You know, I always uh, clown about that with you, Max. Um, right. It doesn't matter what I shake from your hand. You're always coming back for 12 uh, somehow. <laughs> and Kano, of course, I mean, he's going to top deck, you know, triple fork yeah. lightnings in a blitz, which shouldn't be legal anyway. <laughs> right. And he's going to murder you. So it's, it's amazing, though. I mean, it's just the other day. I think it might have been in uh, the kitchen table event uh, that, that led to you and I spending a lot of uh, uh, time together is I went down to one life and my IRA opponent, a very good IRA opponent was on 10 life. And I chose to do that to fully capture tempo. Yeah. And I, I said, I don't care what happens, but I'm not relinquishing this tempo at all. And if I get a, a couple decent half, uh, half decent draws from here on out, I'm going to win this game. Are a lot of people going to go to one against IRA uh, when IRA is on 10 life? No. But it's, again, it's about understanding the circumstances of the game, what they've pitched, what they've played, what, what uh, dangerous action cards they have remaining, and taking these, those calculated risks. Uh, I just don't think the average player is paying attention to a lot of the nuances, and that's going to separate you know, the, the, the standard player from you know, people like yourself that are, that are up on top five leaderboard. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly, I think. And let, let me just ask a question. Is this your first TCG trading card? Yeah, it is. It uh, is. I've, I've never actually been into TCGs. Hmm. Uh, I'm a jock at heart. And, and now that I'm uh, a washed up 40 year old, uh, <laughs> open disclaimer to anyone watching, right? I'm one of the old heads is, you know, now it's time to, you know, c compete in other ways. So I, I got into flesh and blood. I'm competitive by nature because of my sports history. Uh, and, and this is the way I take it out on people, I guess. Yeah. 
it's interesting that you know you have insight into these concepts already um that are prevalent in flesh and blood to win but these are things that have actually been discussed ad nauseum in the magic community and other tcgs for you know two decades now right things like tempo card advantage um and you know tempo being or even compounding mistakes but tempo i think is extremely important in um flesh and blood in general right whether it's blitz or cc or whatever here you're playing you know being able to calculate and understand the the flow the game is going right is this guy going to have to keep blocking every turn or is he going to just take the damage and come at me with a five card four card hand um, i think it's really extremely important to understand that right so one of the reasons why i believe ira is so strong is her consistency right you can block Absolutely. with two cards from your hand keep a blue and a red and you're coming in for kadachi for one kadachi for two maybe five six seven right that's right uh and that's just extremely hard to overcome the consistency right because you know one of the things in card games that's inherent to their nature is um sometimes you're a little your consistency can vary right there's variance in the consistency you might right. draw th three or four blues you might as bravo you might that'd be great as bravo but as sure. ira it's trash or you know a full red hand right so you know that's another concept right it's deck building and putting putting the numbers and the math on your side in terms of variance and consistency right so right. i mean i think that's a core concept to understand is there anything that you do in your deck building to kind of put the variance in your favor in terms of like your four card hands that you draw per turn right i do i mean you know the, those that are that are close will get ims from me all the time and you know i'll be analyzing every single card i mean it's just it's it's the point of being meticulously uh, insane right yeah. um so to your point with bravo you have your, your standard set of, of blues but in blitz of course i adjust that and i adjust you know you and i joked the other day based on what event i'm in i'm going to throw in some random cards to to take advantage of who i know is going to be there and their play style um so in that way the the ability to have a deck and i've i've given people my deck list a thousand times right and, and they've run it against me and and at the risk of sounding arrogant they're going to lose 90 percent of the time and they're going to lose because being familiar with the deck understanding how to pilot it right so knowing the person and how they pilot a deck to me is equally as important as the deck build itself right i can hand my deck to 20 different people and they're all going to play those hands differently uh, even one one of my good buddies that talked uh, Bravo all the day, you, you, you talk about him, right, Rich, uh, my Bravo brother. Yeah. You know, he and I analyze hands for the same four card hand. We're going to play it differently. It's it's unbelievable, and we talk strategy every single day. Um. So so that's the key. But when I go into the build, I like to have enough aggression because when, actually when I see four blues, I'm angry because because that right. generally means I, I'm probably going to swing the hammer. I'm going to be annoyed about it because I want to I want to take someone's head off right in blitz. Yeah. Uh, enforce those decisions. And if I'm on the other end of a hammer swing in a mirror match, I'm going to take your six and I don't even care if you pummel, I'm going to take the 10 and I'm going to come back violently, right? And hopefully threaten some trigger on you. Uh, so, so I certainly have put more aggression in there. I'm not the block, block you down and, and hope you deck or, or block you down and, and hope something good happens in the end. Um, I, I'm anti those strategies. I hear those floating around Kane right, right now. Right. Oh, just deck Kane, just deck him, deck him. Yeah. Like what I'm never going to do in flesh and blood, whether it be in blitz or CC is let the opponent control the outcome. And that's what's to me, that's what's happened, right? I'm going to dictate right. it, uh, to the degree possible. I also am not a firm believer when you play the deck, because to your point, no matter how you build it, you're inherently going to draw that hand that you're going to have three reds and a blue if you're Bravo or three reds and a yellow, or if right. you're Ira, you're going to have the four blues, right? right. And you're going to stare at that. Yeah. Most people are going to blame a loss on that draw. And, and I fundamentally am opposed to that line of thinking, right? And that's where the strategy comes in flesh and blood and why I love the game so much. You know, that single draw, the way it's designed is not the end of the game, right? right. You need to work around that and you need to set up a big turn uh, and decide how to block and what's an arsenal and, and use the cards again to, you know, how to switch tempo and manage that control is probably the singular most important thing 
in the game to me. Um, Rich knows and some others that I intentionally give up tempo in games, uh, especially a couple months ago, just to see if I can recapture it, um, yeah. to challenge myself and, and to learn how to work out of those situations, put myself in uncomfortable positions. Yeah. Uh, because it's just, it's impossible to believe you're always going to have tempo. It's impossible to believe you're going to have perfect hands and understanding how to work those out against the top tier players like yourself, Max. Um, and the Kelvin Laws of the world and, you know, all these other phenomenal players, like you're going to be put in tough spots. They're going to do the same thing I'm trying to do to them. They're going to force me to react to, you know, some various threats and I need to work my way out and grind it out. So, so that's the key more so than just the deck build itself, because everyone's going to go rip, rip it off of uh, online and say, I've got, you know, I've got Max's Ira build. It's like, good luck finishing five and oh, like Max did in the last armor event or, or 19 and 0 or whatever you did so right yeah i uh you know to your point i i think it's extremely important to understand how to play from behind in this game right you know whether that's on life tempo etc um playing to your outs and playing from behind and then you know you said something as well earlier where playing unexpectedly Right, because at the end of the day, your opponent is generally going to know what you can, are capable of, right? right? And if you play it unexpectedly, you kind of put them in that spot again to reiterate where they can make a mistake. So I think that is strong as well. And um, I wanted to get into this. Uh, by the way, everybody, we have the kitchen table TCG uh, champion from the last Thursday, right? So you won the uh, People's Champion, Matt, and all this good stuff. But, you know, you play, more importantly, you played some incredible games against people, right? Um, there was multiple times where you came in from behind uh, to take the, take the win, um, you know, stuff like that. Is there anything from that tournament that stands out in your mind in particular where you had to make a, a critical choice or something that decided the outcome of the game? So... Max, it seems like the past five events I've I've come across you, right? Uh, yeah. which, which is which is an honor. It means I'm doing well in the tournament, and, it, and it's usually uh, indicates the end of my my night. <laughs> um, this happened again, of course, at the kitchen table competitive event, right? Last Thursday. Yes. And, and there I am. No matter what I do, whether I finish number two or whether I finish number eight in the top eight, like I'm Mac, I'm matched up against Max. It's like you calculate that, right? Talk about calculation and strategy. You're like, how do I face Kurt? Right. So, so that's what happens. And and that, frankly speaking, is is it was a very difficult match. And, and I'll start talking about some of the other ones as well. You saw I had some some interesting ones. Absolutely. But when you go against someone like yourself, who's who's ranked, if, forgive me if I'm wrong, I think you're number four, right? Uh, number three in, is yes. today, yeah. Number three, yeah. yeah. So there you go, right? Um, and you're again, you're not going to make a misplay. I can't even force you into a misplay, and and because you know how to handle that, you've seen it all, and so I need to be at the top of my game, and and, and you know the adjustment I made after playing you the past couple times. I'm yeah. just going to swing for the fences every time, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to see how this shakes out. And I'm going to apply as much pressure, and I'm going to apply and, and attack you with the most violent triggers that I have available to me and, and see how it, how it goes. And it, it worked out well in my favor. That time, right? <laughs> yeah. It worked yeah. out well. It normally doesn't, for the record. Anyone watching, just know Max, <laughs> Max dominates this matchup. Um, worked out well. And, and then, of course, I get my Bravo brother uh, in the semifinals, Rich, and I know his deck inside and out, and he knows mine inside out. And for those of, uh, that, that are watching this that stayed up until 1 a.m. watching that semifinal, it's probably one to remember. Uh, that was the epitome of tempo changes uh, because, you know, he pops a tome and gains six life and then swings on my face. And then I'll pop a tome and gain four life and swing on his face. And it is, it is a battle. Um, but to your point, being able to acclimate to those players more so than their decks, it was the key for me. Right. Um, I, I am rarely playing the deck. I, I, I'm very much playing Max Thomas and, and Max's version of Ira and, and your, and the way you play, right? I, I'd like to believe over time, I'm going to be more and more competitive as I play you, right? Just, just oh, by learning your It's tendencies. already happening. Yeah, it's already happening. Um, 
and the same goes for Rich, right? Um, so in, in, the, in the final matchup against Tyler, which is uh, the, the Dorinthia matchup, which uh, I, don't, I don't think what that particular matchup was in his favor that night. Another great player, though. Um, and you may even recall on the turn one of that one, I mean, Tyler was threatening to potentially come for, I mean, he could have come for 15 to 20 damage. And you really have to assess what the possibilities are. Uh, yeah. And Max, I think you highlighted a lot. I, I usually call those out, right? Because I, I like to banter during the discussion and let my opponent know I know what he knows or, or I know what he's capable of, right? It's my own uh, version of mental warfare, I suppose. So uh, as, as I do that, it's, it's not only me assessing the situation, but understanding the consequences of it, understanding what he's capable of and, and letting him know I'm, I'm prepared for it one way or another. Um, so it worked out. You take calculated risks. I'm a, I'm a probability guy. Um, you're not always going to have the card you need when you're playing a 40-card deck or a 60-card deck. And if probabilities are in my favor, then, then I'm going to take calculated risks to, to go for the win. That's what I did throughout that whole tournament. It was, it was really just playing the odds uh, and playing my opponent, vice their deck or their particular hero. I think that's super interesting because, you know, one of the when I was preparing for this interview, right, I was like, man, I got to ask her, how do you always know? How do you always know what they got, you know? And it's just you play, you call it out, you play around it. They have it their own. Right, that's it's uh, it's absolutely hilarious, um, you know, and I think that is a a great skill. Now, do you play poker? I I, I used to. I, I haven't played uh, recently with the whole COVID thing, but yeah, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm a poker fan for sure. Me too, man. I uh, I used to be an online grinder. I mean, I was you know partially making a living off of it at one point in my life, and playing it in person and all that stuff. I love poker. I think that that game, you know, like you said, playing the player, right? And then also understanding what they have in their hand that could potentially beat you and then, right? So there's a lot of... Uh, the epitome crossovers. was that semifinal match. There's a hand I actually specifically recall just because I talk about it with Rich a lot. Uh, I think I'm sitting on maybe six life against him and he tomes to gain life. Um, and or maybe I'm at eight life, but he tomes to gain six, and then he pitches a card and swings the hammer for four. So he's got four cards in hand. He pitches one and swings his hammer for four. And you may recall, it's 1 a.m. I'm still yep. trying to banter with the best of them, <laughs> and I say, what are you doing, Rich, right? You have four cards in hand. Uh, I can't recall if he had one in Arsenal or not. He might have. And you're swinging your hammer for four, which tells me you have a red pummel and you likely have another pummel. You might even have a third pummel, right? And so I'm immediately calculating why he, as a Bravo player, right, with a four-card hand, what are all the possibilities? Why would you possibly choose to do this, right? Because even if you're holding three red cards, you can likely do something better than what you're threatening here. Right. So can you, can you get off? Do you have enough resources to pummel me three times with this? So in that scenario, he was threatening up to 14 by my calculation, the way I played it out, whatever life total I was at. And well over lethal. And, right. and it's those types of plays that are very tricky in how you respond to that type of threat, the very open-ended threat with a ton of resources available, and it's what do you possibly have? Yeah. Uh, and that's where those trade-offs come in, right? What are the probabilities of certain things? I block to ensure I don't die, but ensure that I can uh, gain tempo the next turn as well. Um, I, I happen to have a Tome in Arsenal that turn, um, so I, I was really not wanting to block, so I could really yeah. go for the win the next turn. Um, but again, it's one of those things where he did a good job to force it. Uh, a lot of probabilities, but like you said, knowing what those are, knowing what the possible outcomes are, and then making the best decision based on the probabilities is the best you can do. And sometimes I even tell my opponent, if you have it, you have it, right? Right, uh, yeah. I'm good on you. So. Yeah, <laughs> like in the <laughs> finals, but uh, I, sp I remember that turn against uh in the semifinals against rich and um it was it was uh impeccable right it was great it, that is the like the epitome of high level play um you knew he had the two pummels right you blocked accordingly and you still got to take tempo the next turn right so you took the calculated play it was great um it was really great 
Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it was a good That's time. Sweet. It was a great tournament. I mean, great people in it. It was a really good time. Uh, happy to be a part of that one. And I think I mentioned that was the first time I was able to join because Thursday night's always my date night with my wife. Um, and so that was my first uh, kitchen table event. Sorry, Louie. Uh, I'll try to join more in the future. Uh, risk my marriage for it. Uh, so first experience <laughs> in a really good one. So. Yeah, I, uh, I'm a big fan of the kitchen table uh, events. That was the first one with the top eight. Okay. And that's, that's why that was like the competitive uh, people's championship, right? Which is you. You're the people's champ. There it is. Yeah. Speaking of the people's champ, you know, you mentioned your wife. So you're a, a family guy, right? I am. A family guy. And you're also, uh, let's talk a little bit, you know, if you don't mind, maybe about your background and what you might do for a living and all that good stuff, you know? Sure. Uh, so I, I currently am a director of operations process management for a consulting firm, uh, do work with the Department of Defense, uh, have gone through, you know, a couple of years of school. I see, I see a small one over the max. As, as <laughs> yeah, you've, yeah. Just, you've looked just at, tell them, just tell them. <laughs> just look to my <laughs> LinkedIn profile. But yeah, I've, you know, I, I, I did get an undergrad degree from Virginia Tech uh, in business management. Uh, I went on to get a master's in intelligence because uh, that was my field of passion. Uh, I did some work uh, supporting the FBI for a period of time. Uh, and then have, you know, gotten various, uh, finished various programs and certifications from Harvard Business School. Uh, nice. so, so my day job consumes me uh, as I sit here in my shirt and tie for your flesh and blood. <laughs> right. um, interview. So yes, I have a day job uh, that keeps me very busy uh, defending our nation, etc. in various different capacities. And and also a family wife and, and two girls that keeps me away from all of the events that I'd like to join for flesh and blood. But when, right. when I can hop on and be competitive and throw down with you, Max, uh, I'll take that. It's always a good time. Yeah, that's, that's right. uh, <laughs> you know, I think, um, I knew I knew you were a, a very good player and smart and calculating, right? And then when I heard your background, it kind of clicked. I was like, "Wow!" So he does this for a living, almost, right? <laughs> Strategizing, thinking ahead, and at the, almost the highest level in the world, right? Department of Defense, yeah. military, and stuff like that. Do you think that lends to your, I guess, one enjoyment of the game and two uh, competency of the game, right? I mean, I th I think everyone every. Every experience someone has brings something to the table, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not going to say it's a disadvantage. Um, hard to say if it is an advantage. Like I said, that's why I try to play the person more so. That's where one of my strengths is, is, is understanding yeah. uh, not only probabilities, uh, because I'm a math head, but also understanding uh, sort of the psychology of the game uh, and understanding the game design itself. So. I'm very much try to, like I said, understand what they're attempting to do, because uh, if I understand your motives, uh, then I can better diagnose how to respond to them. So uh, I suppose it it plays in to some degree. I think it's gotta help, right? <laughs> what's uh, man? This is a question just from me to you, really. What's Harvard like? Much less Harvard Business School, you know? What was it cool? You like it? I mean, tell us a little bit about going to Harvard. So it's, it's interesting because there's, you know, I, I love learning as, as, as odd as that is, but I, I, I love to learn. I'm a sponge. I try to soak up knowledge and, and I get bored with a lot of courses, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've tried to take advanced courses in a number of different places and they just didn't, they didn't do anything for me. Now, Harvard Business School is different. Uh, I know a lot of people, uh, that goes without being said, but yeah, it, it is a different beast. You learn from some of the best. You know, I've taken uh, a course, Disruptive Strategy, which with the late Professor Christensen, who essentially built the the theory of disruptive strategy. I mean, so you're dealing with the wow. world's best. Someone who taught leaders at Apple and Google and you know, world world renowned companies how to do business and how to think about strategy. And you know, suddenly that individual is my professor. You know, uh, and, and we're working in a cohort with other global leaders about how to solve complex problems and, and brainstorm these things together. So just a tremendous experience to, to learn from the other leaders of the world, uh, contribute what knowledge I, I may have uh, and hopefully help them. But, but the caliber of individuals that you get there and the caliber of, of knowledge and curriculum is, is second to none in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much everyone in the United States knows and probably the world even. You know, Harvard is the elite. Right. That's uh, I mean, I think 
that's i know when i was a kid right i uh middle school and stuff i was like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna go to harvard and be a doctor scientist and all this you stuff still should max drop the I iron still should. pop over to harvard <laughs> and get it done <laughs> you need to take that i don't uh, all right nice that's it's awesome. number one on the priority list i should have had the ringer <laughs> off to begin with oh it's okay <laughs> Um, dude, yeah, I don't know. I've been thinking about going back to school, but I have no idea what I would do. I, uh, I'm just a sales guy, you know. I like doing sales, but um, yeah, I well, think I'm sure you cross it, so whatever you want to do. I I do all right. I do all right. But uh, you know, back to uh, back to the game, right? So you started. Your buddy got you to buy a box or something, right? You said, That's right. and then you started playing it. And uh, you said you're a huge collector. Let's let's talk a little bit about the collection side, right? Sure. So, you know, I have a couple cold foils. I love the cold foils. I started collecting cards when I was real young. Um, Pokemon, right? So third grade, okay. eight or nine years old. I've been going to the same local game store. Uh, I'm 30 now. So when I was eight, I was going to this guy. He's still down there. And he's going to let okay. me do like my own armory event under his store and stuff like that. But yeah, so I've been, you know, collecting the cards for a long time. I still got some first edition and stuff, but I think one of the draws to flesh and blood for me, it originally was the collection aspect, right? I, right. they announced the pro tour. I'm a big competitive player, right? That's my number one focus. They announced the pro tour and on the same, the day before magic, the gathering had a closed their pro tour right i don't know if you heard about that but they said they were stopping doing the pro tour so i said i'm going all in i immediately went down to my lgs i um bought up everything they had and i started looking up the price i pulled like an arc knight skull cap and a skull bone cross wrap in the same uh box i was like oh man i got like a you know command and conquers art of wars and lightning strikes I mean, the best pools of my life. So I immediately loaded right. up TCG player, looked up the pricing, started an account, and I was flipping these cards into more and more boxes, right? Um, and then I got to the the cold foils, right? I, and I started collecting them. Uh, let's talk, you know, about how you started into the collecting. Was that first or was the gameplay first or how did that kind of evolve? So I bought that first box with the idea to flip it. Right? right. But of course, I bought the unlimited box because I, right. I was wholly ignorant on the topic and it still flipped it for money. And I was like, there might be something to this. And as I started playing, you know, uh, you know, now that you've already covered my background, I, I try to research things before I dive in too deep. So right. uh, I went to the source and I started studying James White. And I said, forget the nonsense. I don't care what the market's doing. I want to understand James White as a person. Uh, to the to the degree I can before I, I move in. And, you know, he has a background in international business. Yeah. Right? Um, and so understanding that he understands supply chain management, he understands logistics, he understands international business, uh, obviously he has an experience with TCGs, et cetera. These components are more important to me because uh, I understand the, the sort of the standard S curve of any business life cycle, right? That you sort of uh, invest and then you have a massive growth and then you, you plateau and it's what you do to that point. So having confidence that James White and team understand that curve and understand how to handle it uh, was more important to me prior to investing in it than anything else, right? Uh, then, of course, once I became a player and I learned that, okay, functionally the game is great, even though I'm not hyper experience in TCGs, this game is hooking me as a non TCG player. That's enough test on, on that front for me. Yeah, that's key. But then I, then I started investing. Um, I started buying sealed alpha boxes, sealed uh, arc first boxes, wow. sealed crew first boxes. Uh, there was a point in time where I went pretty deep. I mean, we're not, uh, I know saints went, went real deep. Yeah, I went almost as deep. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, now he he gained his, a lot more value because of the timing of which he did it, right? So his money went a lot further uh, than than mine because he got in very early. So you know when he's buying boxes that, and, and I don't know what he bought boxes for. Let's say you know eight six hundred eight hundred dollars, whatever the case might be. Right. You know I'm buying boxes for 
you know, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 a piece, you know, the money's yeah. just not going to go as far. But nevertheless, that's how committed I was to the game um, that I saw an opportunity there. Uh, that said, I study the market well. I keep my finger on the pulse of it. Um, I take the data points available to me. You know, I guess the second shout out to Louie, who does a great job with his market Absolutely. analysis updates. But uh, frankly speaking, I don't, uh, these are all data points to me, and, and I try to keep my own eye on it as well. Um, so, so I sell product as well, you know, okay. uh, just like any investment, just like the stock market. Uh, if, if I see trouble in the market, I'm going to move uh, and, and change my position to mitigate risk. Uh, so, so I do that, but, I, but I'm heavily into the collector side of flesh and blood and uh, now equally as much so into the, uh, the actual gameplay. Gotcha, man. That's uh, that's impressive. So you're you're rocking the alpha. You got the first edition arc. You got you got some of that stuff too. Uh, at, at one point, I'll tell you right now that the position is light because the, yeah. the market spoke for itself. Uh, for sure. And so seeing seeing the writing on the wall, you know, I mitigated that position. Uh, but but those things are temporary. Again, I have faith, uh, as I know many people do, in James White and LSS, um, and I'm just trying to play the market smart. Um, it didn't take Harvard to know that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. So sure. why hold a box and wait for it to rebound when I can sell it and put that money to work uh, in other ways and right. then rebuy my position at another point? So, so I, I try to understand, stay true to my business fundamentals uh, while staying committed to flesh and blood at the same time. For sure. Yeah. I, um, you know, it's funny. I did the same thing, right? Before I went all in and on the competitive side and really learning the end because there's a time commitment invested into learning the competitive side of any anything right so Absolutely. i checked out james way i listened to all the interviews and this guy cares you know sure. i i think i can really tell that he's super this is his life mission right you know i mean i and i respect that a lot and so you know i'm gonna go in in it right um I'd like to collect more. I, uh, you know, I have, I have a wife and two kids as well. So it's, it's a lot harder for me to get into the super collecting side. You know, I mean, the best thing I have is, uh, a courage of blade hold, uh, cold foil, right? Let me find it here. Yeah. This guy right here. It's That's enough. the best one I got. And it's cool. That's some good art too, but nothing wrong with that card. No, nothing wrong with that card. Um, I actually got it in an unsealed. Uh, I don't know if you follow the Chris Sires and the Flesh and Blood unseals. I could tell by I could tell by yeah. the, the case. Itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. You got to get that, man. That's money right there. I love that. <laughs> Shout out to Chris Sires. Uh, that's some fun, fun times right there. Yeah. Um, so you know, but again, I'm I'm a more of a my goals with the game are to play at the highest level, compete on the Pro Tour, World Championships stuff like that right i chased that for years with magic the gathering and it just almost even playing 13 years it's almost not feasible because they keep raising the bar for like how many tournaments you have to win to even get a spot and then within the last two or three years they shut the spots down completely they were handpicking people to compete so it just got super frustrating um you know, and then the there's so much variance in Magic the Gathering. It's very hard to consistently compete, right? Which right. I do not think Flesh and Blood has that issue. I right. think um, the way the game is designed so that all of your cards are offensive, defensive, and resource pools is negates a lot of the variance that can happen in a card game, right? So that's... You know, when I started playing the game, I was like, okay, there's a real shot here of someone who takes the time, invests the time and the knowledge to learn the game, they can compete at the highest levels, right? Absolutely. So I decided to undertake that, right? I've been grinding. I do a lot. So I've been playing since May 28th, right? You know this already, but... Yeah. Uh, 540 lifetime XP right now. All that within the last 90 days. I've got 155 wins, 62 events since May 28th. Um, so I'm I'm just in love with the game. You are everywhere and you are dominant. Uh, yeah, those I, those are the two major takeaways. Yeah. I can't join an event without seeing Max Thompson's <laughs> name in it. Yeah, I was like, where's this guy? 
I was looking, uh, no joke, Max. I was looking yesterday, right? Because my wife uh, was, was said she'd be, you know, uh, going to bed early one day next week, like pre-planning her her early bedtime because we have two kids. And I'm looking at some event in like Sweden, and you're signed <laughs> up for it, okay? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about, Max? Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. I'm like, where is this guy? Right? How are you finding this stuff? But nevertheless, yeah, you're everywhere and yeah. and you're dominant. It's it's great to see. Yeah, so I will shout out to uh, my friend Kugane Gaming, and he has put together this Patreon calendar on Google where he has all the events that you can join, it, and it'll update it to your time zone and stuff like that. So I just go on, look for the events for the day, I sign up. I try and play at least two a day. Yeah. You're a machine. I'm a Good machine, on you. man. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks, man. But, you know, we've talked about this. I don't think that XP is the gauge of skill that sure. some people think it is right uh i grind it because i i think in the future they're going to invite people um to pro level events based on your xp right sure. so nationals the nationals in uh, november being the first one so that's what i'm aiming for there where yeah uh, and inherently yeah. to your point i mean playing in those events you're getting exposure to uh, different play styles, different different yeah. individuals, and frankly, top level global competition. I mean, the people competing in the, these online armor events that we're playing against are are the top hundred in the world, right? Uh, for all intents and purposes, you know, given which event you're playing in. But I mean, so you can't match that caliber at your local event. You're going to find quality players around, uh, and I, and I do play in the local scene. Uh, if if we get to that topic, but yeah. but it is it is different in in many ways. Absolutely. You know, uh, someone asked me a couple of weeks ago, like, oh, you know, do, you know, you're always playing online. Do you ever play in person? I've never played a game in person except against my little brother, you know? Okay. And uh, we have some local events, right? But I'm not, I'd rather play the online event because exactly what you just said, the caliber of player is so much higher, you know, than some local guy. No, I mean, the local guy could be pretty good too. Right. But I just think I'd rather go against someone like you or some of the kitchen table team guys, kitchen fable team guys. They're really good. Kelvin Mall, um, Kugane. These guys are, you know, they're thinking up here with the game. Right. So. So it's funny you bring this up, Max. Right. So I've I've only played online up until four weeks ago. And for the past four weeks, I've gone to one local event each week. Every Friday night, the reason why you don't see me online is I'm playing in my local event. Nice. And, and thankfully, I've, I've gone four for four in-person armories. All right. So uh, four, yeah. you've won all four in the last all, four. Or won all four. Um, it, but I'll say this. The, the, there are tremendous players in this armory. And, and honestly, it surprised me because, you know, maybe I was being arrogant, but to your point, I'm like, the, my local competition and group cannot n be nearly as competitive as the individual I'm playing online because, because I'm getting the world's best. Shocking. I mean, the Armory event I won last Friday, I was down to one life in round one, right? I mean, we're talking some amazing players, and that's even more what I love about the game is these individuals – who no one maybe know about on in, in the standard online armory events are coming to war yeah. and they've built these decks that are not the meta, which frankly makes them scarier. And, and they've devised the way to try to beat what they know to be the meta and they've come prepped and they play with, in, with their play groups. I mean, there's a couple guys who are coming to your point who used to be uh, MTG pros yeah. uh, that play in my local armory couple guys who are on the u.s national uh war machine team who you know i guess that i don't know anything about war machine but i guess that has been is being stood down because of covid you yeah. know their their travel as a national team and they've moved over to flesh and blood so these are the highest level competitors moving into flesh and blood and they are bringing they're bringing it max yeah and i've got to be sharp on my game and to your point be ready for the unknown because these people aren't playing the standard, the standard builds and it is challenging. And I try to take away everything, whether you be a beginner or, or an amateur or, you know, mid-level or professional, you know, there are no professionals, but you know what I mean? The top level competitive people in fab. 
And, and I'm taking something away from all those experiences. And frankly, being in person, I know that's how James White intended it. It's yeah. a different beast. Um, there are times online I get lax and I'm having a good time. You know, Max, I'll joke around oh, yeah. and, and put myself in those difficult spots to try to dig it out of. In person, it's it's another, you know, that adrenaline gets going. It's, right. it's that, again, that jock competitiveness in me where it's like, I'm not losing face to face to you, right? And we're going, we're going at it. But I can also pay more attention to what, you know, Chain is doing. He's not going to pull some, uh, I won't curse on your channel, but he's not going to no, pull some okay. shenanigans, you know, on his, on his banish stuff. Like, I'm going to see what you have there and, and Kano, you know, as you flip 8,000 cars, I'm going to see exactly what's going on. And yeah. you're a bit more in tune, you know, with, with what's happening in the game and you're more connected to it as well. So I certainly appreciate the in-play. Uh, so I'm excited for you know, what's coming and lifting COVID restrictions, but I'll never sure. ditch online for, for the reasons you mentioned. For sure. Yeah. I think I'm hoping, right. I've never played in person really, but there, I know in magic, I used to play a lot of magic online as well. Right. That's been around for years, but uh, it almost felt like playing against a computer, right. They're, they can't cheat online. You know what I mean? You can't read their face, see what they got. You can't see if they're ready to counter your spell. Um, but yeah, being able to see someone's face in flesh and blood, are they checking their arsenal when they're attacking, right? But what you know, are they looking at it multiple times? Are they shuffling their hand around? Are they unsure what they're gonna do? These are all things that you can uh, a skilled player can use to their advantage to help win a game, right? Absolutely. Uh, they reveal information in their body language, and that's powerful to take advantage of. Absolutely. You know, and, and you hear it, Max, right? I, I... Whenever I'm playing Ira, there was an individual I played, whatever it was, yesterday or the night before, where I tried to elicit that online, and it's difficult because I can't see their face, right? Yeah. But he'll play, you know, the second Kadachi for, for two, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm in the danger zone. I might be sitting at three life. I'm like, do you have a razor? Like, are you about to razor me? And I tried to get that information, oh. that tell, that is so much more difficult online. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah. so it's, so like I said, it, it's good in the sense that it forces me to play the odds and the math, right. And more so than, the, than the player to a degree. Uh, and then also, like I said, you really have to pay attention to what's been played, what's been pitched, uh, even more so online, you know, cause I just hate being inconvenient and being like, we flipped through your graveyard for me for the 8,000th time. instead of sure. just reaching across the table and, you know, flipping Check through. Out. Yeah. Um, so again, pros and cons to both sides, but but the level of competition, top to bottom, online can't be replicated at a local event, right? The, right. the last place person at a local event uh, is a certain caliber player, and the last place online uh, is a much higher caliber, in general speaking. I'm sure you have your pockets, uh, but that's what my local event is like. Right, so your local is... What are you playing at the Curio Cavern, or where are you playing? I play at a place called uh, Born to Game. Born to Game, uh, it's, okay. It's, it's, yeah, it's a small shop. Uh, down in, in Woodbridge, Virginia, okay. so I'm in Northern Virginia. Nice. But yeah, Curio's up the street. I haven't made it out there yet. Heard, heard it's a good scene. Yeah, I'm trying so. to go to their Road to Nationals event, but it's already okay. closed up. Are you going to that? Uh, signed up, man, but I think uh, kid obligations are going to take me from it. Oh, man. So when I drop, I'll give you a call, man. You can take my spot. Dude, that would be, that'd be tight. <laughs> we can talk yeah, about like, that later. Like, like you said to me the other day, though, if you're going to take my spot, you better you better take it home. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're talking a little bit about in-person play. You know, what what are your future plans for competitive high-level, like, in-person games? So, like, you know, I just asked about Road to Nationals, but maybe Vegas, the Callings, Nationals itself. Do you see yourself doing anything like that? So most people are surprised when I say I don't have plans for it, right? Um, certainly those that have, have lost four weeks in a row to me at uh, Born to Game, sorry. Um, but, you know, they're like, what are you doing, right? Go to, go to Road to Nationals and, and see if you can, can handle it uh, and see if you can compete because, you know, they at least are under the belief I can, and I'd like to believe I, I could as well. Um, you can. Yeah. But it's tricky. It's tricky, as you know, right? This ring, this ring comes with a lot. The two kids come with a lot, so it's it's very tricky. The shirt and tie and the day job uh, play into that. So, yeah. you know, I used to play against um, uh, Vlasta, you know, number one player in the Czech Republic who runs his dash deck, and that guy's playing sixteen hours a day, right? Trying to yeah. get XP. I mean, just round the clock. It's 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 un unbelievable. I don't have that luxury. 
um, I used to play once a week. And now, you know, most recently over the last week, you've seen me three or four times because tr I'm trying to get uh, more involved. And, and the wife was under the weather, so she's going to bed early. So right. you and I got to see each other more often. For sure. Um, so it really depends if I can work it in. Uh, I'd, I'd like to qualify if I can make it to a road to nationals. Uh, I think I might be able to get to one of them. And I'm just going to have to show up and perform. Uh, and then the, the second route, like you said, is just grinding for XP. But I also don't know if I have the time to do that. But yeah. it's something I'd love to do. Um, I think it'd be a fun scene. Uh, head, head down to nationals and, and compete face-to-face sure. -face against those people. Go to another level. And, of course, that takes us into CC, which is a whole other world. Uh, to me, it's a whole different game. Yes. And one that, frankly speaking, I don't think a lot of the experienced Blitz players are ready for. But, but that's a separate topic uh, if you want to go yeah, there. But, yeah, yeah, I, I agree 100%. You know, um, I think since I've started playing, I've really only played a handful of matches with CC, so I'm kind of worried about that, right? I've been looking for people that I think are up to snuff, so to speak, that I should spend my time testing with them. Um, it's kind of rare to find someone. i test with you, though, Kurt, you know, <laughs> but... Uh... I appreciate it. Yeah, we should definitely jam some we should throw CC. Down for sure. Yeah, we should for sure. But, you know, to your point, it's a totally different game. And I think a lot of the new players, they focus on Blitz. They play a lot of Blitz. The online events are Blitz. And it's just a different beast in CC. Um, you mentioned Vlasta, right? And I've never beaten him because he's playing, you know, to another point you made earlier, he's playing a deck that's not on the map, right? He plays Dash. And not a lot of people have experience against Dash. You know, what do you do? It's like they're shooting you for six to eight damage per turn and they're blocking with their whole hand, you know, or whatever. That's but right. it's just and then, you know, back to CC, I think a lot of people a lot of people tend to take the obvious route of okay, I need to deal forty damage to this person to win. Right. I, me personally, I guess I'm kind of pivoting here to like my CC strategy, right? Maybe bouncing some ideas off you though. If you look at this game in a different light where, okay, they're playing 40 red cards or something, right? And you add that damage up, what is it? Maybe 80, 90, you could do the math. It depends on the deck you're looking at. But what if I built a deck that could block the entirety of their red cards? And then you just fatigue them out, and then that's GG, right? Your only opponent is the clock at that point. So there is, you know, mathematical strategy in this game that I don't think too many people outside of uh, Brennan Patrick and his crew are really thinking about too much, right? You know, what are your thoughts on a strategy like that? So... I hear a lot of strategies going around, Max, and, and I joke, you know, with my inner circle about some of them because you've got a lot of content creators coming about talking about meta and the way to beat Chain and CC and the way to beat yeah. Prism and CC. And I fundamentally disagree with, I think, about 98% of the content that I've heard. And, and what's not getting enough recognition, I think, is, is how well someone can sideboard if they understand the opponent uh, well. And, and the reason I say that is Prism, let's take Prism for example, who I think is grossly, grossly underestimated going into CC. Prism can give you, you know, three to four different looks depending on, on what hero uh, is being faced up against you. You can go aura control, you can go aggro, you can go some sort of hybrid, you can go with Iris of Reality. Uh, you can go with uh, Luminaris. There's so many different elements that they can throw at you. And, and understanding, again, how to sideboard against Prism, or if you are Prism, how to sideboard against uh, whether it be Katsu or Bravo. And people are like, oh, you know, Bravo's a horrible matchup for Prism. I don't agree, right? right. And so there's these fundamental pieces that that I think are grossly misunderstood. And to your point, I don't think enough analysis has gone into the proper way to play CC against various heroes and what's being filtered through online, which I actually am happy to see people digesting, is just not gonna cut it yeah. in the road to nationals. Uh, and I think it's gonna be a rude awakening for those that aren't putting in the time like yourself who are 
focusing on deeper analysis and, and, and sort of fundamentals and what's the worst that can happen and, and how do you counter it. Uh, your, your strategy is interesting. I haven't seen your build. I can't wait to. Yeah, we got to play. It, it fundamentally goes against what I like to do, which is uh, let someone else dictate uh, what's occurring throughout the game. But again, you're dictating in your own way by blocking them, and that's your right. uh, uh, win, win condition. The other piece I think that people struggle with is uh, and I don't. I don't like quoting Mike Tyson ever, uh, but I'm going to find myself doing it one time in this interview. Is you know the whole idea of win conditions, like hey, if you're Bravo and you play chain, here's what you need to do, is fundamentally nonsensical to me, right? Agreed, hundred uh, percent. The whole Mike Tyson is uh, it's all great if you have a plan until you get punched in the mouth. So everyone has a plan until you get punched in the mouth, and that to me that's what flesh and blood is. Is that if you have a deck that cannot pivot mid game then you will lose against the top players in the world a hundred percent of the time. And, and that's why when I design a, a deck, it doesn't have a singular win condition. Otherwise I just won't win. Right. Yeah. I have to have multiple ways to win this game based on what you do. Right. If Max Thomas shows up with, with control Katsu and it's just going to block me out, then I need to figure out a way around that. Right. And my right. sideboard needs to reflect that. And sure. if, if uh, you know, the meta is going to try to block out chain and, and deck him, then, you know, again, I, I'm going to go against that in some way. Right. So it's, there's a lot of, lot of content, uh, very little of which I agree with, but happy to play test. Yeah, I agree. You know, I, I'm glad to see the content. I'm glad to see some of these articles and stuff. I think a lot of them kind of jump the gun, right? With speaking their mind about the strategic sides of the game. Um, you know, obviously right now we're looking at tier zero is chain, right? Because he can come in for 20, 30 damage in a turn, you know, has to get lucky to do it. Um, but then you also see this aggro Katsu deck coming in that's trying to race chain, which I think is not the way to go. Um, I think it's impossible to race chain, right? Because he's starting off the game at 50 life with the husk, the cap and the gloves, you know, sure. Katsu's got a helmet that blocks for two, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. but, it, you know, it can be done. We've seen it done. The charity event tournament list where the that popularized the Agri Katsu, I think, you know, that's a great deck. That's a, I think that's a greater player, right? Yeah. And I think that's a lot of point. That's a point that goes over the head of most people looking at the list. Like, wow, this must be a great deck, right? No, that's a great player. That probably capitalized yeah. on some mistakes, pivoted the game style, all these things, to, you know, to take it down. But and to your point, I mean that that's the key, right? It's it's almost impossible to teach someone all the nuances because it's it's about the feel of the game. I, I hate to use loose, touchy feely terms like that, but no, it's true. you have to understand what's happening in the game <clears throat> to be able to counter it. And and this is all circumstance driven, right? If if I'm yeah. prism and I'm playing chain, for example. You know, am I running Merciful Retribution and Ode and if I'm running Aura against Chain? Or am I going to try to time the proper use of Arc Light Sentinel and Herald of Judgment and, and really massacre one of Chain's great turns? And, right. Right? And, and you think about how to do this, and, and let's say you pull one of those cards early and understanding what to do with that, right? Do I pitch that and try to get to a late game? Do I arsenal it? Understanding these nuances and what is happening on the other side of the table is going to be the difference between winning and losing. Absolutely. Uh, you know, regardless of the win strategy going in. For sure. You know, I think one of the key things about this game that not many people touch on is like the decision trees that open up and it's infinite, right? Like, you know, a great point is do I, do I use this now? Do I pitch this for later? Or do I arsenal this card? You know, there's so many decision trees that end up affecting yep. the, how the rest of the game plays out ultimately. And I think there's so many opportunities for someone to make a mistake, even an innocuous mistake, or even it's, this might not be a clear cut mistake right now, but That's something right. in the game that the opponent does makes it a clear mistake, right? That's right. So uh, I, I think it goes back to how we started right and capitalizing on the opponent's mistakes forcing them to make difficult decisions that amplifies their mistakes things like to this is like a key to conquering the cc format because 
sometimes even just blocking with a card is a huge mistake right Absolutely. much less if it's a red card it's a you know it could be anything it's there's just so many decision trees um there's a I mean, really Max, how many times card. online have you seen someone block you which right uh -huh. with a card and the very next turn forget five turns from now right but the very next turn they'll be like oh, i shouldn't have blocked with that a lot I, a lot or i i, I shouldn't have pitched that oh that right all the time all the time man you know generally i'm pretty forgiving in non-competitive armories right like you can, roll, you can roll it back a little bit bro like it's right. generally when i'm ahead by a large margin but um it happens all the time or the amount of people that will block the first kadachi because they're scared of the razor when they are literally throwing the game yep. on the spot by doing that um yep. let's say they're at three life or something right and you snap take the kadachi you can't afford to play around the razor Right? right the game's over whether i hit you with the first you know what i mean That's if right. i had the razor the game's over so yep. whether you block it through it or not but you know it's things like that um understanding when you can afford to play around something and then understanding as well on the flip side when you have to play around something or you're losing the That's game right. on the spot right pummel yep. is a great one right yeah. you know I, what i mean our matches are great, right? Because they I are. recall specifically dominating a spinal crush and, and calling out at the time. I said, "Your call, Max. Right? You yeah. either give me your mask of momentum, or or you're going to lose go again. Right? Yeah. Your call. What you want to do? And but it's it's those decisions that it doesn't matter what caliber player you are. It's a crap decision any way you go. Yeah. Yeah. And. And who knows what the right answer is, right? Because yeah. how are you going to know if blocking with mask, you know, the effect mask is going to have the rest of the game? Right. It's, it's impossible to, to forecast that. And you're forced to make that decision. Anyway. God, you're making me right? relive that. That was very Sorry, hard. I'm, no, it's okay. You know, I think, uh, you know, Kurt's referring to our semi our quarterfinals match the, at the Kitchen Player TCG People's Championships or whatever. Uh, I think it was your second turn maybe yeah first or second yeah. first or second turn and you know essentially he was dominating a crippling crush and i had to think about the implications of, of my next turn right so i ended up blocking I think, with yeah, the I mass think turn one dominated yeah. spinal right yeah 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 exactly i think so yeah you would have had to throw your mask that's why. yeah i was drinking some brewskis right so it's hard it's a little <laughs> fuzzy but it stands out clear as day it was a dominated attack that would have shattered my next turn and yeah. my hand was good my hand was real good you know um and that was a tough decision i have to think i think about it all the time right like maybe i should have just blocked with nothing right i don't know i don't know but uh interesting yeah, for sure. that, that's the point right, right. That those those decisions uh are, are the key in how you handle those um and and even the best players, again, they're not incorrect decisions, but you're right. just forcing them to consider things that they wouldn't normally want to consider. So. For sure. Yeah. Forcing bad spots. Um, you know, there's a really famous Magic the Gathering strategy article written years ago, um, I believe by Mike Flores, and it's called uh, Who's the Beatdown? Right. So fundamentally, in a game of Magic or even Flesh and Blood, one person is the aggressor and one person is kind of defending their attacks right sure. and, it, and that that can change during the course of a game or you can force the like sometimes maybe you're at a neutral state no one's the aggressor no one's the attacker so you can say you can make plays to become the aggressor and then sometimes you can make misplays to force yourself to have to become the defender right, yeah, right. um yeah. and i think that goes to your point where you're actively trying to take the tempo from people, right? Um, you want to force becoming the beatdown, the the aggressor, and force them to become the defender, especially as Bravo. I'm, but I'm sure you that goes to your place out with any hero, right? That's right. And, and to your point, the key is understanding when to do it, right? So you know, someone might walk away from this interview having listened to it and be like, "I'm just going to go <laughs> rip people's faces off." <laughs> And, and that's not what's intended either, right? You have to understand, you know, to your point when you're playing Chain and you're staring down Carrion Husk, if I dominate a Cripple and Crush, does this do me any good right now? Right. And, and understand the trade-offs because sometimes you want to get it off and sometimes you don't want to get it off the field. And, 
And so you really have to get reps, right? You just have to get reps. You have to understand the trade-offs of the game and what it means and, and why a crippling crush on turn one is better or worse than a crippling crush on turn three and why you should arsenal it or pitch it or whatever the case might be. And, and that takes time. And that takes, yeah. uh, like you and I said, competing against, I think, the world's best for sure. to, to really pay for the, those mistakes and learn from them. Right. Before you can turn the tables on someone else. Definitely. You know, I think that's a whole nother video in itself. Right. It, but sure. I think, um, you know, well, one, we've been doing this for an hour now. It's been an engaging conversation for sure, Kurt. Uh, you know, I think to kind of wrap it up, where do you see yourself and your goals in this game within the next year? And where do you see the game in the next five years? So the game, I have complete faith in the game. Um, I actually previously wrote LSS asking to do a Harvard case study on James White wow. about the business. Because, um, again, the business side interests me almost more than the game. And yeah. I love the game, obviously. That's, that's what we're here talking about. For sure. Um, but the game is going to be here. And the game's going to be fantastic because I have, like I said, an underlying foundational belief in what LSS is doing and that James White and team understand how to overcome the challenges they'll inevitably be faced with and already have been faced with. And, you know, I watch the content too, that they've done things well, and they've had some hiccups yeah. as any business uh, that is growing will have, but, but I think they've handled it eloquently and as efficiently as possible. So, so kudos to them. For sure. Agreed. Uh, separately, my own goals um, are to be as competitive as possible, given my time constraints. And, nice. and with any luck, uh, the idea would be to to be at nationals and and compete at the highest level. Um, and, and if I have success, then I'm going to continue to try to do that uh, moving forward. Um, I'll, that's that's pending a conversation with my wife if she watches this video. <laughs> Are you going to show the wife? You going to show the wife? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm going to show the wife. Yeah. yeah, my wife was actually uh, approval. she was crawling around on the floor. She didn't want to interrupt the video. It's like, oh my god, man. <laughs> she's hilarious. But yeah, yeah. So, so she, she'll drive that. But but yeah, the goal is obviously I'm not wasting reps here online just for the banter of of, of uh, talking to Max or taking my beatdowns from you on a regular basis uh, in in hopes to exchange one victory out of every five matches. <laughs> the goal is to get to the top. Yeah, and and that's just again the competitive nature in me. Uh, if I'm going to play it, I'm going to be the best I can be, uh, and I'm going to try to take it all the way. So that's the goal. Not only do I want to be at nationals, I want to win it. Yeah, uh, wife permitting. Um, For sure. So, uh, but the game, the game's going to be here, uh, and as long as the game is, I hope to be as well. So uh, I think I fell. I listened to James White most recent interview. I I think I fall in the median. Uh, target demographic. So I still have another, I think he said 16 to 60 is the tar target dem demographic. I don't think he uh, uh, pinned it to that, but I have at least 20 years by that short answer by James. So I'm good there to go. There you go. There you go, man. Yeah. Well, Kurt, thank you so much, man. It's been a great talk. I'm sure we will do this again, hopefully soon, right? There's a lot to talk about with this game. The game is great. There's a wide array of topics. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, you're one of the best people to talk about it with. So I appreciate it. Yeah. You as well. You're the man. Yes, sir. You know, I'm a huge fan. Huge Thank Max you. fan. Thank you, sir. All right, Kurt. We will uh we'll talk to you later, boss. Yes, sir. Take care. Out here.